Welcome to Micro, a podcast for short but powerful writing. I'm your host, Drew Hawkins. Myths and monstrosities, loggers and legends. This episode comes with three pieces on being, both less than and more than, that blur magic and reality. Our first piece is an incantation for the average folk, the ones that don't attract curses. Or do they? Written by Michael Cunningham and featured in his collection titled A Wild Swan from Macmillan, it's called Disenchantment. Enjoy. Most of us are safe. If you're not a delirious dream the gods are having, if your beauty doesn't trouble the constellations, nobody's going to cast a spell on you. No one wants to transform you into a beast or put you to sleep for a hundred years. The wraith, disguised as a pixie, isn't thinking of offering you three wishes with doom hidden in them like a razor and a cake. The middling maidens, the ones best seen by candlelight, corseted and rouged, have nothing to worry about. The pudgy, pockmarked heirs apparent who torment their underlings and need to win at every game are immune to curse and hex. B-list virgins do not excite the forces of ruination. Callow swains don't infuriate demons and sprites. Most of us can be counted on to manage our own undoings. Vengeful entities seek only to devastate the rarest, the ones who have somehow been granted not only bower and trumpet, but comeliness that startles the birds in the trees, coupled with grace, generosity, and charm so effortless as to seem like ordinary human qualities. Who wouldn't want to fuck these people up? Which of us does not understand, in our own less presentable depths, the demons and wizards compelled to persecute human mutations clearly meant by deities thinking only of their own entertainment, to make almost everyone feel even lonelier and homelier, more awkward, more doubtful and blamed than we actually are? If certain manifestations of perfection can be disgraced, or disfigured, or sent to walk the earth in iron shoes, the rest of us will find ourselves living in a less arduous world, a world of more reasonable expectations, a world in which the appellations beauty and potency can be conferred upon a larger cohort of women and men, a world where praise won't be accompanied by an implied willingness to overlook a few not-quite qualities, a little bit of less than... Please ask yourself, if you could cast a spell on the ludicrously handsome athlete and the lingerie model he loves, or on the wedded movie stars whose combined DNA is likely to produce children of another species entirely, would you? Does their aura of happiness and prosperity, their infinite promise, irritate you even a little? Does it occasionally make you angry? If not, blessings on you. If so, however, there are incantations and ancient songs. There are words to be spoken at midnight during certain phases of the moon beside bottomless lakes hidden deep in the woods or in secret underground chambers or at any point where three roads meet. These curses are surprisingly easy to learn. Michael Cunningham is the author of The Hours, among other novels. Things look a little different when you're taller than the tree line. Our second piece, The Monstrous Sadness of Mythical Creatures, was written by Amber Sparks and published in Matchbook Lit. Enjoy. The Monstrous Sadness of Mythical Creatures 
He's tired of everything, most of all the loggers skating around on that stupid frying pan. Don't they realize that shit gets old after a while? I mean, it was kind of funny the first few times, but never exactly hygienic after all. God knows what kind of bacteria he picked up last time he ate flapjacks out of that pan. He got so sick he passed out, and he toppled right over onto a family playing frisbee. It was terrible. They had to peel the dad off his left shoulder, and his shirt was all covered in bloodstains and ruined, and it's not cheap to get a custom-made flannel shirt the size of a football field. Which is why, when all the loggers run round his feet, chirping at him and pointing to the frying pan high on the wall, he gets a little angry and accidentally stomps on one of them. It's not like it never happens, and the other loggers know the risks. It's a calculated risk, his size relative to the work minus his temper relative to his size. But still, it's never good when he kills one, and he has to go see the wife and kids and pretend like he understands. He can nod every once in a while if he is careful, but mostly he must stand extraordinarily still, leaning on his axe and trying not to breathe too much. There's a funeral inside their tiny church, so he can't come in. He stands outside, hat in hands, but he can't even hear the priest and the mourners. All he can hear is the tinkling hymns spilling out of the church windows like glass. It's lonely up here. They don't understand how lonely. They think they'd like to be big, to have his arm span, his strong swing. They'd like the earth to shudder wherever they step and forests collapse in their wake. They think it would make them important. They don't know that nothing is important when it's taller than the tree line. Anything that tall becomes more landscape than person. He's especially sad now that Babe is dead, now that he's lost all his hair and most of his teeth. Now that he gets arthritis in his wrists and his back cramps up every morning. Now that the earth is grown so small, there's no room for the bigness of him. Sometimes he tries to remember what his story was once. Why he was the myth the people made for themselves, he and Babe, back a long time ago. Back when he walked the land free and easy and putting one huge foot down in front of the other, creating contours and hills and lakes. When he left behind shoveled up earth and felled forests, traveling westward with the rest of the company. He knows it's not a story anybody needs anymore. The air is thinner now, and the long past is crumpled behind him like too much paper. Sometimes it seems like there couldn't possibly be any more trees. What he needs is to retire, though he knows he'd have to go away to do it. He knows these loggers aren't going to suffer him to stick around, keep feeding him if he's not earning his keep. But that's okay. He supposes he wouldn't really miss their tiny voices, their incomprehensible phrases and gestures. He just wants to sit for a while on a cliff somewhere, high up and barren and far from any trees, his monstrous head closer to the stars than any other living thing on earth. Amber Sparks is the author of And I Do Not Forgive You, The Unfinished World and Other Stories, and the short story collection May We Shed These Human Bodies. You can find her on Twitter at Amber Noel or on her website at AmberNoelSparks.com. Our third piece holds so much and asks to be held. Written by Kirsten Renault and published in No Contact, it's called What I Think King Kong is About, Never Having Seen King Kong. Whether or not you've seen King Kong, enjoy. I think maybe King Kong is about the dangers of colonialism about how people aren't supposed to be everywhere, how knowing your limitations is a virtue. I think maybe King Kong is about how cruelty always backfires, and eventually animals will take over and it will be our own faults, and then I realize I'm thinking of Planet of the Apes, which I've also never seen. I think maybe King Kong is about me, about how I've gotten anger in my heart, how I'd like to make all of New York, where I've never been, stand in awe of my enormousness, how I'd rather do that than try Weight Watchers again, try to make myself small and holdable again. 
Maybe it's about how women are supposed to fit into the palm of a hand, or maybe it's about how I think I'd like to hold a woman in my hands and know she loves me back. Despite my size, despite my rage, despite the fact that maybe we defy the laws of nature and possibly physics. I think maybe King Kong is about defiance in a way that is not necessarily proud, but demands to be seen. I think maybe King Kong is about looking things in the eyes. I think maybe King Kong is about how sad the gorillas in the zoo look when they are alone. Or maybe it's about how apes cannot cry, but sometimes they make a noise like weeping. I think maybe King Kong is about how not being understood can make anyone want to destroy something. How Washo the chimp learned her captor's language to be heard. How she tried to cry when her baby died, but couldn't make the tears come. I think maybe King Kong is about being enormously climbing the Empire State Building, forcing witness outstandingly alone. Kirsten Renault is a writer living in New Orleans whose work has been published in a variety of places and nominated for the occasional award, including Best in the Net and Best Microfiction, as was the case with this piece. You can find her on social media at Renault Glow or on her website at kirstenrenault.com. That is our show, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. This episode was edited and curated by Dylan Evers and produced and hosted by me, Drew Hawkins. Our theme song is by Matt Ordez and Maymay Kaufman runs our social media. Find us on LitHub or our website at micropodcast.org or wherever you get your podcast. And if you liked Kirsten Renault's work, you'll be delighted to know that she also runs an interview series at Micro called Five Cues with Kirsten, where she interviews writers featured on the show about their work. Check it out. We've got a full transcript up on our website, and if you need subtitles, check out our YouTube page. We've got links to that on our website as well. Subscribe to the show and leave a review if you like what we do and you're feeling especially generous. It really helps people find us, and we super appreciate it. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Podcast Micro. Thanks for listening.